tatra, tatra, pinandini. The lighting now here, now there. It's part of the description of the craving that gives rise to suffering. It has a location. It focuses on a spot. And in that spot, it creates a little kernel for what you want. Around that kernel comes your sense of who you are to, to get that thing, and the world in which you're going to get that thing. That's how becoming comes from craving. But that sense of location is important, because sometimes it goes here, sometimes it goes there. It's very hard to track down. And as the Buddha points out, often we're not really clear about where our cravings are. These are the things that run our lives. And often we don't even know what we're craving. You may have a desire for a person, and you think you desire the person. But maybe it's your perception. Maybe it's the way you talk to yourself about the person. Maybe that's what is the real allure. This is one of the reasons why interpersonal relationships can be so fraught. You think the other person wants you, but they don't want you. They want their idea of you, or they're attracted to a narrative that they create around you and it involves their identity. Of course, you're doing that to them. This is why the Buddha has you stop and think. There's a passage where he says, something you've never seen before. Is there any craving there? And your first reaction would be, well, yeah, there's lots of things that I haven't seen that I crave. But when you just stop to think about it, it's not really the thing itself that you crave. You crave your image of it, your anticipation of it, how you paint that picture in your mind. That's where the craving is focused. So you really do want to pay careful attention to where your cravings are, because they will lead you. You know that image the Buddha gives of the fire going from one house to another. And if your craving is totally unknown to you, here you are giving your next life over to a force that you don't even know. It's a scary thought. So he lays out the various places where craving might be focused. Any of the six senses, any of the objects of the six senses, and then contact at the senses, consciousness at the contact, feeling born of the contact, perceptions for sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, ideas, intentions for those things, directed thoughts, evaluation, the way you talk to yourself. Craving itself can be an object of craving. So you can see how slippery it is, and how it can be just about anywhere. When you stop and think about it, when you die, as I said, this is going to be the force that leads you on. When you see how fickle craving is, it makes you really want to figure out some way to get beyond it. This is one of the reasons why we practice concentration, is to get to know our cravings. We're going to crave stillness of mind. It's a perfectly legitimate attitude to have towards the path. Sometimes you're told you should practice the path without any desire, practice the path without any sense even that you're doing the path. Well, the path's not going to get done that way. You have to develop the desire of right effort, the desire to prevent unskillful qualities from arising, or if they have arisen, to the desire to abandon them, the desire to give rise to skillful qualities, and once they're there, the desire to maintain them and develop them. And that effort is directed here at getting the mind into concentration. You give the mind a location. You give your craving a location. You're going to stay here with the breath. And you've got to watch over it to make sure it doesn't move. 
And of course, it will move. But you want to be alert to it. You begin to understand, well, this is what craving does. It focuses here, delights now here, and then delights over there someplace else. It's pretty fickle. We complain about the objects of craving, saying that they're impermanent or inconstant. But the craving itself is pretty inconstant, unreliable. But it is something you can tame. And as you tame it, you get to know it better and better. And you see what it means to have a location. And how the mind creates a sense of identity around that location, you as the meditator, and the world inside the body as the world in which the meditator functions. You're seeing all the processes of becoming the ones that can eventually lead to birth again. But at the same time, you're making your gaze a lot more refined and a lot steadier. So you can sense when the location of your craving moves. You can exert some control over it. That, at the very least, is what you want to be able to do as death approaches, so it doesn't just run off, take you someplace you have no anticipation for at all, or suddenly find it's been lying to you all the time. You're making an honest person out of your cravings by making them steadier, more focused, more reliable. And then you learn how to understand them. It's in an understanding that you can take them apart. This is what the Buddha means by comprehension. By craving leads to a state of becoming, by creating that sense of location. You see that precisely as it's happening, because you're, you're trying to make it happen right here, so you know it really well. I think it was Kant who says, we know best the things that we do. And so you're going to do the craving consciously, rather than in ignorance. That way you can begin to see through it. You see how it creates locations, and how the sense of location is something that's not necessarily there. Because after all, when you get rid of craving, as the Buddha said, you're released everywhere. There is no there there. As he says in one spot, it's neither here nor there nor between the two. There is no sense of space or the dimensions of space, because there's no craving there to create locations. We think the craving simply finds locations, and it does, but then it creates them too. You get really good, you can find out what it's like not to have a location. That's when you're free. That's one of the reasons why we work so hard at getting the mind into concentration and keeping it here, so we can know this process of creating a location, exactly how the mind does that, so we can take it apart. So don't be afraid to desire concentration. Don't be afraid to desire to do it well. Because it's in doing the concentration and desiring it that you learn what desire is all about and what it does. And when you see the subtle s stress even in a state of concentration, and the mind inclines to something better than that, you've raised your sights. It's when the mind is inclined in that direction that the opportunity for the deathless will open up. This is how we use desire to put it in desire, how we use craving to put it into craving. We use it so that we can understand it, because it's only when we understand it that we can go past it. <laughs>